Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Dagny Sharon, and I'm in the Local Liberty Movement. This program is being taped live at Dagny's Freedom Festival in Inglewood, California. Today we have an excellent program by a good friend of mine, and to introduce her, I give you Tom Cobb. Thank you. I've had the good fortune to know Wendy for a long time. I first met her, and my first reaction, which would be kind of understandable, oh, there's a pretty little girl. Wrong. This is a very formidable young lady. She has written Freedom, Feminist, and the State. She's editor of The Voluntarist. She has taken on, personally, the entire LA County Board of Supervisors. I admire her courage, if not necessarily her taste. I mean, uh, you're known by the company you keep, Wendy. And <laughs> but um, Wendy is going to speak on feminist history revisited down the Orwellian memory hole. And we all know what that is, presumably. And if we don't, I'm sure Wendy will be glad to elucidate. Wendy? Good afternoon. Well, this afternoon I intend to commit an act of heresy. And like any act, it requires a context. So let me first of all set the context before I explain my per particular heretical views to you. The context is, of course, libertarianism, or that's part of the context. And that, as, no one, as it will come to no surprise to any of you, is the non-initiation of force. The second is the definition of feminism. And this is a little bit more complicated because there's vast disagreement and debate about what feminism is. I've heard feminism related to everything from lesbianism to the Green Peace Movement. But I think there's at least one definition that most people, most women will agree on. And that is that women as a class should be equal to men. Now there are feminists who believe that women are biologically superior to men and should be treated such, but they're a very minimum. So basically, let's take that as a working definition of feminism. Women as a class should be equal to men as a class. Now, already with this definition, as I'll tell you later, we're in deep trouble. Just defining it this way, as simply as it may seem, creates as many problems as it obviates. But, this is at, but I'll get into that after I basically give you the history of what I consider to be the proper form of feminism, the type of feminism that I advocate, which is individualist feminism. Now, feminism, as a movement in and of itself, started around 1830. There were individuals who worked and, and did very good work before that, but as an organized force in America, it started in the 1830s. And when you're talking about this, this organized force, you're talking about abolitionism, because that's where feminism sprang from. Abolitionism was a radical anti-slavery movement in America which demanded the immediate cessation of slavery on the grounds that every man, every woman, was a self-owner, which means that simply by being a human being, there is something about being born human in that condition which says that you have a right, an unquestioned right, an inalienable right, to your own body and the fruits of your labor. And when you're talking about abolitionism, what you are talking about is William Lloyd Garrison and the Liberator. Because these were the two main, William Lloyd Garrison was in fact the one who infused abolitionism into the anti-slavery movement. One might think that anti-slavery called for the immediate cessation of slavery as, 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 as a matter of course, but there are various brands of anti-slavery. Abraham Lincoln was anti-slavery in the sense that I think in something like 1859 he called for the, the gradual abolition of slaves in 100 years, which means in 1959 or, or we would have been all seeing the end of slavery in America, which is a rather chilling thought. There were anti-slavery people who called for colonization. It was William Lloyd Garrison who infused abolitionism, the immediate cessation on the grounds of self-ownership, into anti-slavery. Now, he also did one other thing with abolitionism, which was to fuse abolitionism with women's rights. He had, in, I believe, in the second volume of his periodical, The Liberator, the volume number might be wrong, but very early on in its 35-year career, he had what was called a ladies' department. And in the ladies' department, right underneath that caption, he had a slave woman kneeling in bondage and, and piteously crying out, am I not a woman and a sister? That's where that phrase comes from. And when you deal with women's rights, what you're dealing with is the influence of, a, of, a, of 
William Lloyd Garrison, an, an avowed libertarian in the terms of he was totally against government. He was called a no government man. He was totally against the use of force in, in human relationships. And you're also dealing with the Quaker influence because overwhelmingly in abolitionism, there was, there was uh, it's, the roots were Quaker. Basically, as you go along in history, it, it, and it became more popular, more and more people were subsumed by it. But initially, within America, its roots were Quaker. Now, Quakerism, even though everything is relative and you can't say that women's rights were respected by Quakers in the same sense that women's rights are respected today, nevertheless, Quakerism did allow women to preach. Women were allowed to be ministers in the church. They were treated as equals more or less in the church as opposed to Calvinism or, or, or Catholicism or other religions of the time. So relatively speaking, it was a bastion of women's rights. So you have this fusion here. Abolitionism, William Lloyd Garrison, the main anti-slavery paper, the liberator, being an advocate of women's rights, and you have the Quaker attitude of basically, comparatively, women are, women are human beings on an equal basis, at least religiously, with men. Now, abolitionism freed women in two ways. The first way could be expressed by Abby Kelly, who said, to paraphrase her, we have, we have learned a great deal and we owe a great deal to the slave, for in trying to throw off his bond, bondage, we have found ourselves that we are securely fettered. Women were led to say, if in fact we're fighting for rights, are we just fighting for black male rights or are we fighting for human rights? Are we not subject to the same oppression that the black slave is? That was one way. They, they were ideologically prompted to ask this question. And the second way was women, for the first time, went out and lectured in public as, as, a, as a strategy. Now, it had been done before on an individual basis, but as a strategy, women going and giving a series of lectures, traveling across the country, these women were mobbed. These women were assured that they would, would never be married because, in fact, a lecture before a mixed company such as, such as we have here, mixed me being male and female, meant that no, no man of any respect would marry them or touch them. They were, they were vilified in, uh, I'm, uh, by the way, I, I hope that doesn't ruin my plan, so I don't, don't intend to get married myself <laughs> being an anarchist, but uh, <laughs> the, first, the first three women to do this were the Grimke sisters and Abby Kelly. And, uh, and even though, I, though the, the, I could go through stirring passages of what these women put up with and, what they, and, and, and their heroism of, of breaking social taboos, which were, were at least as significant as legal walls. It's a very heroic struggle, but I will, for the sake of, of, of time and continuity, not to mention my theme, I will continue. Now, abolitionists, I don't want to give you the, the impression that abolitionists were to a man fighting for women's rights, because this wasn't true at all. William Lloyd Garrison and Theodore Weld, another figure that I can't go into, but who, is, who has heroism in of, of himself, were very strong on women, women's rights, at least to the extent of saying that women must be allowed to participate. They, they are a strong moral force in this country, and without them, we cannot have an effective anti-slavery crusade. But many people in the anti-slavery movement said, well, first of all, many people in the anti-slavery movement were not for women's rights, but many who even were sympathetic toward that point of view said, we're taking two issues here. We're, we're taking anti-slavery, toward which many people would, would feel a natural empathy, and then we're taking women's rights, toward which overwhelmingly the country is against. And we're cementing them together, and one, one is acting to the detriment of the other. Why don't we treat them as separate issues? Why don't we just totally divorce anti-slavery from women's rights? Fortunately in America, or unfortunately, depending on your view of strategy, William Lloyd Garrison was, was very effective in making sure the two came together. Not so in England, and a crisis was met at the World Anti-Slavery Society, which meant in London, England in 1840. Now, Lucretia Mott, a, a fine, fine old Quaker lady who was very effective in underground railroads and, and uh, civil disobedience in terms of, of um, anti-slavery, along with William Lloyd Garrison, were cho chosen as representatives of the New England Anti-Slavery Society to attend the meeting in London. What happened? They show up along with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and many other women who, who came across the ocean, which was no small feat in those days, to attend the meeting. They were turned away from the door. The British abolitionists, the British anti-slavery movement, movement did not have a garrison, did not have a Theodore Weld to champion women's rights. 
Women were not allowed to attend the meeting that they were elected as representatives to attend. They were shut out. Eventually, they were allowed to sit in a balcony with a screen around them. Now, William Lloyd Garrison's response, as the response of various other American men, was to say, we will sit in the gallery with the women. We will not sit on the same floor that basically refuses to, that, that tries to push forth black rights while denying human rights at the same time. What happened as a result of this, and it's rather an irony of history, is this, this denial of women's rights led to one of the most important events in women's history, in American history. When I say women's history, by the way, I, I fall into the trap that I've been accused of many times. America is not the world. When I say history, I mean American history. So one of the most important events in women's rights in American history, which is the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Now, this was a direct result of the London experience because Lucretia Mott and Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who both attended, attended and both were shattered by this experience of being denied access to the movement to which they'd given their lives, formed the first women's rights convention in Seneca Falls. And there, another significant thing happened. Up until this point, when I say that the two main influences on women's rights were William Lloyd Garrison and Quaker, Quakerism, Another thing that I'm implying by that is a strategy, the strategy of moral suasion. This was a strategy which said that because change must, must occur in the hearts and souls and, and minds of men, that's where the war is. It's not in the, in, in, in the legislatures, it's not in senates, it's not in Congress, it is within the hearts of men. It's rather like the Gandhi attitude of the only demons that exist in the world are the demons within man's hearts, and that's where the war must be fought. At Seneca Falls, Elizabeth Cady Stanton pushed through, a pa when I say she pushed through, she, she presented a plat being any political, I'm, I'm likely to, to weigh my words. She uh, presented a platform which basically said women should seek the vote. Women should seek political power. There was a great deal of controversy over this. Lucretia Mott, representing the old guard, opposed it bitterly, and I believe it passed by something like one or two votes, a very, very narrow margin to pass by. But what it did was it, it offered a split in strategy in women's rights for the first time, in feminism for the first time, moral suasion versus political action. Now, something else happened very shortly after that, something which the United States has never recovered from. Every, every facet of the United States of America is still being affected by it, and feminism, perhaps more than many others. Libertarianism certainly was almost dealt a death blow because of it, and that was the Civil War. There is no event in American history that is being as catastrophic as the American, war, American Civil War. Feminists overwhelmingly supported the North in that war, even though many of them were Southern. The Grimke sisters, for example, came from South Carolina, one of the rabid if, if you, if you think, think of Deep South, if you think of the ones that, that basically were, were the rabid southern, southern states, you think of Georgia, you think of South Carolina, they were from South Carolina. Nevertheless, they overwhelmingly supported the North. The only exception that I found of a major feminist who did not sub subvert and subordinate all feminist goals to the Civil War has been Susan B. Anthony. And when you think of it, the outcome of the Civil War should have been a victory for feminism. After all, slavery was abolished, and they linked their cause very, and their, and their, their um, consequence very closely to the slave. And the Republican Party was, was the one that, that was the victor, the Republican Party being the anti-slavery party, so that their friends, their anti-slavery friends like Wendell Phillips, was now in a position of power. It should have been something that the feminists benefited from, but in fact, it was, it was a disaster for feminism. Because what did people say now? Their friends in the Republican Party said, this is not the hour of woman, this is the hour of the Negro. The 13th, the 14th, and the 15th Amendment were given top priority by all the anti-slavery people, and women who, who came and said, but not only does the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment not benefit women, it introduces for the first time into the, male, into the Constitution the word male. The word male was introduced for the first time into the Constitution after the Civil War. And this outraged feminists, totally. And what happened here, and where I will end for, for the moment, my history of feminism in general, is that there was a schism. 
There was a schism within mainstream feminism as well, but in terms of broad, broad categories, and I must be forgiven for making generalizations in a very short period of time. Some of the generalizations are always inaccurate to some degree, but I believe that, that, that basically this, there was three general paths that feminism took. Mainstream feminism became overwhelmingly political. The drive was one goal, the vote. Socialist feminists, although they would not call themselves that at the time, perhaps, but ones that tended toward what we call socialism, became known as social feminists. During the progressive era, or even before, they were the ones against child, child labor, they were for the Pure Foods, Food Act, they were the ones that basically pushed through a lot of legislation of that sort. What we call individualist feminists became involved in two movements. Least successfully, they became involved in the labor movement, most successfully, they became involved in the free love movement. And that's what I want to discuss for just a moment, because this will set the context of what individualist feminism is and what I, what I mean when I call myself an individualist feminist. Now, free love has been defined mostly by its enemies, which is never a good way to get an understanding of what something means. So let me, let me give you basically a very simple statement of what free love is. Free love is the statement that all sexual matters, as long as they do not involve force, are up to the individuals involved. Marriage, divorce, legitimacy claims, abortion, contraception, birth control of any sort are between the individuals involved. The state has absolutely no business whatsoever in people's sexual lives, as again, again with the exception of force being brought in. Now, I can't do anything in this short a period of time except give you a flavor of how rich and deep and, and, and stirring and how much, how much fun this tradition really is. So let me, let me pick out two incidences to, to let you know, you know what you're missing out on if you have not read in the, in the background of individualist feminism. There was a periodical called Lucifer the Light Bearer, which is a great title, great title. Lucifer being the one who, who brought fire, like Prometheus, brought fire down to knowledge, down to earth, and like Prometheus, paid the price of being cast out of heaven and, and um, into the fiery pits. Now, Lucifer the light bearer was put out from, uh, from Valley Falls, Kansas, by a man named Moses Harmon, who had a daughter named Lillian Harmon. Lillian Harmon fell in love with and married, I believe, the contributing editor, though he might have ty typeset as well. Uh, a man named Edwin Walker. Lillian was 16 years old. They decided that they would get married without the benefit of clergy or of the state. At the age of 16, she was thrown in jail, as was he. They were one of the first couples in America thrown in jail for violation of the marriage laws. If you ever want to, want to model a marriage after, after a ceremony or just want to read a very stirring account of something, you should read the marriage ceremony. It ends with Moses Harmon declaring, I refuse to give away my daughter, for I wish her always to be the owner of her own person. You know, great stuff, really good stuff. <laughs> now, another part of our tradition of individualist feminism is the word, edited by Ezra Haywood, and the, the period of that is about the 1870s. Oh, by the way, Lucifer the Light Bear was also in that same, same general period, to give you a context in time. Now, Ezra Haywood was imprisoned for Cupid's Yokes. Cupid's Yokes was his uh, birth control pamphlet. And it was, uh, to put it in, in blunt terms, boring. It was one of the most boring pamphlets I've read in this period. His main way of, of achieving birth control was abstinence. Nevertheless, for this pamphlet, the man was thrown in jail, was arrested and thrown in jail. Not only was he thrown in jail, but several people who sold the pamphlets, very and, and uh, rather prominent figures in society, were thrown in jail. He was released after a massive petition was, was presented to the president, and he was, he was thereupon released. To show you the spirit of the man, he was thrown in jail again. Uh, by the way, the, the law under which he was thrown in jail was the Comstock Law, Anthony Comstock, one of the truly evil figures in American history who uh, passed a law which prohibited the mailing of obscenity in America without defining what obscenity was. But whatever it was, it included birth control material and contraceptives. So Ezra Haywood thereafter immediately advertised in the word a contraceptive device called the Comstock syringe. <laughs> he, was, uh, he was arrested again. <laughs> And what I want to impress upon you is not that these people had a sense of humor, 
what I want to impress upon you, this is, the, this is the 1870s. We are told about Margaret Sanger, and who is rather socialistic in many of her aspects, and we, we, we hear about the heroism of these people. And, and they were heroic. I, I don't mean to take anything away from these people. They fought very strong battles, and they, they took risks, and they paid a price. But what I'm saying is this is the 1870s. The last issue of the word in Ezra, Haywood, Ezra Haywood's The Word, his wife, Angela Haywood, wrote an article proclaiming the right of every woman to abortion on the grounds of self-ownership, that she owned her own body. Now, I want you to, to pause for a second. This is the 1890s. We're not talking about Margaret Sanger. We're not talking about the progressive era in the 1920s. Or, we're talking about a very early period. And we're talking about pioneers. We're talking about really, really breaking social taboos. Think about the Grimke sisters lecturing. Think about Angela Haywood. Think about Lillian Harmon going to jail. And when we talk about an Orwellian memory hole, that's what I mean. These women, you'll have books and books written about minor socialist fig figures. As far as I know, there is one book that even has a chapter on Lillian Harmon. And that's not because there isn't material there. I've researched it, and if I had more time, I, I would write the book myself. But to get on to my theme and to beca become heretical at last, as I promised at the beginning of my talk, I want to say that there is no necessary connection between libertarianism and feminism. My definition of feminism is that women as a class should be equal to men as a class. Now, when I say there is no, give me the benefit of the doubt, those, those of you, you who, are, who are now dismissing what I say, give me a benefit of the doubt for about 10 minutes, and I'll explain what I'm talking about. Now, when I said there was trouble with the definition, women as a class should be equal to men as a class, I think there are two problems with that, at least two problems. One is the idea of class. Now, different political theories have different class structures, different theories of what is a class. And a class really is nothing more than a group of people banded together by some arbitrary standard. I could class people, I could make a class of redheads on the standard of who has red hair, I could make a class of people under 18. It's merely just a category, uh, category defined by some standard. Now, in libertarianism, the class analysis, libertarianism being the non-initiation of force and the political philosophy, which is based on self-ownership, the class analysis, since classical liberalism, since Franz Oppenheimer, long traditional history, is that the political means is opposed to the economic means. There is a political class and there is an economic class. The political class is that which, which gathers wealth through taxation, through the use of force. The economic class is the one that produces. Very clear distinction. Now, there's a problem with this in terms of looking at women as a class because women fit into either category. Women can be politicians. Women can also be productive members of society. Marxism has a similar problem. They define class as, with reference to the means of production. Now, by this, you can either be a capitalist or you can be a laborer. You can control the means of production, or you can be exploited by it. Same problem. Women can be capitalists, and they can be laborers. Now, Marxism has come up with, a, with Marxist feminists have come up with a parallel theme, a parallel political structure to Marxism to explain this, which is called patriarchy. Now, I could incorporate, incorporate patriarchy into libertarianism, but quite frankly, patriarchy, unlike the political means, does not necessarily use force. And I don't see how it can be integrated. Moreover, since libertarianism says self-ownership means that every human being, simply by being a human being, has all the rights any human being can have, it leaves absolutely no place for women's rights, gay rights, black rights. You ask, are these people human beings? Yes, they have all the rights. That you don't need this extra qualifier, women's rights, black rights, gay rights. There are human rights. Now, having posed this puzzle, let me try to unravel it and tell you why I consider myself a feminist. And I want to make a distinction here between women's rights and feminism. Women's rights is the statement that women should have equal rights under just law. This is not necessitated by libertarianism. Libertarianism does not necessitate that we say women should have equal rights under just law any more than it says necessitates that uh, Australians should have equal rights under just law. What necessitates it is government oppression. 
government has selectively oppressed certain classes of people in its history. And just as we, we do not have rich man's rights, which rich white man's rights, because they've never been necessary, governments never oppressed rich white men. On the other hand, equally, we need black rights because historically, historically government has oppressed blacks. We need women's rights because historically women has, have been oppressed. And what it is really is a sort of division of labor and defense of rights, a sort of specialization. Many people are oppressed. We all, we all know that. They're oppressed to different levels and in different, different cases and different circumstances it changes with history. And to the extent that you want to attack the oppression of government, you can't simply go out and say, I'm going to attack oppression. You have to have some focus. You have to say some law, some event, some class. And what this is, is a sort of specialization. And libertarians, I submit to you, must be pro-woman's rights simply because government is oppressing or has. I, 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 I am very aware of the objection that women now are a privileged class, and I agree with that, that objection, but have historically attacked women's rights. So I submit to you that libertarians must be for women's rights simply because it's a specialization of being for rights in general, and government has created the need for that specialization. But this is different than feminism. There are many books that have no necessary implications for law or rights at all. It's how to assert yourself with men, how to be a single mother, how to be successful in business, how to coordinate your wardrobe, everything from that to, to, basic, to uh, how to change your psychological being, how to, how to confront feelings of inferiority in the culture, whatever. Things that are what I call cultural or social change books that have really no legal implication whatsoever. What they, what they aim at is a changing attitude in society toward women. It's like racism versus black rights. As libertarians, every person in this room must be for black rights. To the extent blacks are oppressed by government, they must be for black rights and make a special category saying that I am for black rights. They don't necessarily have to be anti-racist. I would be upset with them if they're not, but I wouldn't say it's a violation of libertarian principle for someone to have, have in their mind an idea that blacks are somehow biologically inferior is a wrong idea, I think, but I don't think it's a violation of anyone's rights. Just as to have in their mind that I am biologically inferior or that I should not be given a certain job because women, after all, can't handle stress, you know, they have that time of the month or whatever. Is, is a rather lamentable attitude. Never the right is not a violation of my rights. So, to re recap what I'm saying, libertarianism is a political philosophy which advocates rights and justice. And to that extent, one must, if one is a libertarian, be totally for women's rights. Feminist is an, is a, is a, an attitude or a philosophy that champions fairness in human behavior a fair attitude toward other people, a sense of what you, which, what, we, what you want to call common decency, perhaps. And to that extent, one need not be a, fem be, need not be a feminist if one is a libertarian. I think if one has a, has a sense of justice that, that is not merely abstract, but tends to go into your heart and soul, then you should consider feminism very, very, and, and anti-racism and things like that, very deeply. Now, Many people say that the free market will cure the, the unfairness which women experience from society. That's usually thrown up as a, as a cure for this dichotomy between uh, women's rights being violated and social change. And I'm, I'm, really, I'm rather skeptical about that. I believe that it will go a great, great distance toward curing unfairness toward blacks and unfairness toward women. But I'm skeptical of it on two points. First of all, the free market does not say that people's values will be rational. The free market does not say that we will all be reasonable human beings. All the free market says is whatever our values are, they will be maximized by the free market. For example, people will be fundamentalist Christians. If there were a free market today, I, I fully believe that there would be Calvinists out there. And their values will be maximized, the maximum number of Bibles, the maximum printing presses without obstruction by government. The other reason is that economic arguments really don't work in all cases. 
I've recently gone down to the south quite a bit on business, and there is a country club that, that's very posh that, that I've gone to on business, where you, you pay $200, $300, I don't know what it is, a month to belong to. At the age of 40, you have the option of, of paying $30,000 to join. Now, I've heard the argument that slavery eventually would have been phased out by economic means, and, and like saying that unfairness toward the woman toward women would be, be abolished by the market, I think that's largely true. However, from the, the experience of the South and the country club, and I'm not anti-South, I, I like the South very much, it's just a point that I think has some validity, there is a certain prestige and elegance to having the, the aristocratic lifestyle, which Jefferson, for example, who had slaves and was against slavery, maintained because there's, sim there's simply a prestige and a certain lifestyle which probably would make slavery something that would continue to some degree, very limited. So I'm not, I'm not totally convinced that the free market will cure things. What I think will cure things is a change, as William Lloyd Garrison said, in the hearts and souls of men. And this is something that has to be done through an education process that cannot be done with at the point of the gun, which is, which is of course, law, which is, of course, legislation. You must change the hearts and souls of men. You must go back to pre-1848 feminism when moral suasion was, was uh, the strategy. Now, to put it in a different manner, there's a sense in which freedom is true. There's a sense in which you can logically deduce the nature of man and natural rights. There's also a sense in which freedom is beautiful. There's a sense in which it touches the heart, the emotions, the possibility, the sparkle, the optimism in man. And to put it very succinctly, I'm a libertarian and for women's rights because it is true. I am a feminist because I think the attitude is fair and, and, and appeals to common decency. I am also concluding because a sign is being held up which says I'm out of time. Thank you. <laughs> I think there are time, there's a little bit of time for question and answers. Ah, yes. When you get arranged for publication of this, it's excellent. <laughs> oh, uh, I will put it in the next, in one of the upcoming issues of the Voluntarist, which I, which I edit. So if this is a, this is a subscription drive you're hearing right here. <laughs> yes. Oh, I, I meant the same thing. I, I think it's, I, I would have no discomfort in terms of exchanging your word for mine. And aren't there some values which are discouraged by a free market in the sense that a welfare state might protect people from experiencing the full costs of their actions and a free market might indirectly encourage responsibility? In, in, in other words, if bigots have to pay for the bigotry. Oh, sure, absolutely. But the thing is, uh, what I'm saying is a free market will tend to minimize unfairness so that, that great example by soul of, you know, of someone who has a basketball team will not uh, discriminate against, against blacks, <laughs> you know, that great free example. But, but uh, the fact is that I do not for a second believe that it will eliminate it, it will minimize it. Uh, bigotry, in some cases bigotry will be rewarded. In, in a small town where most people are racists, um, to be an anti-racist might lose a great deal of business if you hired a black to be a clerk in your store. You know, it, it, free market really does not say standards of, of common decency will be in play. All it says is rights will not be violated. <laughs>